Man, we are so thankful for Chris and for Josephine and, and them being vulnerable and transparent and sharing their story. Uh, and that's exactly what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about today. But before we, before we dive in, I just wanna say good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning if you're watching online or if you're out on the lawn. Man, we're so grateful uh, that you guys are with us. We are going to wrap up our Anchored series this morning. Has anybody enjoyed this series as much as I have? I've had a good time. Uh, learning with you, uh, and I always always say that I am learning with you uh, as much as I as I get to do this and, and share with you on Sunday morning. Uh, the Lord has taught me, and I've had to go through the lesson uh, prior to. So you're not learning alone; we are learning together in the process. And so, uh, and so their story their story makes me think about this last this last point that we're going to get to in this anchored lesson. If you're coming in here uh, new, or if you're stepping in for the very first time. Uh, uh, we would encourage you to go back and check out the rest of the series. You can do so on our YouTube channel, or I, I think we even have a podcast as well that you can put on in your car. Uh, but this series is all about what it practically looks like for us to be followers of Jesus. We have traced the, the footsteps of the first century early church uh, after Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. And so we celebrated, celebrated Easter Sunday with you, and then we said, okay, now what? We have connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Now, now what? How are we as Christians supposed to, supposed to live? And so we have been following the example of Jesus's early followers. And they give us this, this foolproof picture in Acts chapter two of what it was like after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And as he is seated there, he gave his disciples and the rest of his followers this commission, right? Like, Go therefore and make disciples in Matthew 28 baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, and so all of his followers decided that they were going to devote themselves to a few things. And those are the things that we, in the last now four weeks, have decided that we would devote ourselves to as well. So the first one was the apostles' teaching, which means that we were going to be devoted to the Word of God. We were going to spend time with Jesus in his Word, knowing that if we do not spend time in the text, we cannot look like Jesus out side of this place. And then they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to one another, taking responsibility to their neighbor, to the left and to the right of them that is in the body of Christ. And then last week we looked at, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer, which meant worship and remembrance. We're going to devote ourselves to remembering Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. And we are going to devote ourselves to fully worshiping him. And then you get to the end of the passage in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 47. And it says this in verse 47, which is the last thing that we believe the, the disciples and the early followers of Jesus devoted themselves to. It says this, and each day, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And what this communicates, what this communicates to us as followers of Jesus is that they, the followers of Jesus in the first century church, were relentlessly in pursuit of lost people. They were evangelizing people. They were, they were intentional about sharing their faith. And what I love, what I love about this is that they didn't just leave it up to the apostles. They didn't just leave it up to the people that were closest with Jesus, that walked the road with Jesus, that, that were hand in hand with Jesus. No, once these early followers connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, they took it as their responsibility to share the gospel just as much as the early disciples, just as much as Peter, James, and John. The rest of the followers of Jesus said, no, this isn't just your job as an apostle. This is ours as a family. And so they took responsibility for it. When I think about like responsibility for, for the faith and for sharing the gospel, I think about, think about this place, right? There's a large responsibility of the grounds and facility of this place. I oftentimes walk around the facility or I'll come over here for staff meeting on Tuesdays and I'll look at the lawn and inevitably somebody has left a, a paper cup or a plate or a utensil or something is out there and I walk past it often and I'm like, somebody needs to pick that up. There's been a basketball sitting underneath the basketball hoop for about six months. I know it's flat. I know it doesn't work. And every time I walk past, I'm like, somebody should pick that up. 
And what happens to, what happens to me is I, I start to get fussy, not like, not outwardly, just inwardly, you know? And I'm like, man, I, I wish somebody would take responsibility and pick that thing up. And what happens is by about the third time in the day that I walk past it, I'm like, I'm going to go pick it up. And I go and I take responsibility for it. But here's, here's the question is how many times is it going to take for us to walk past our neighbor or our coworker or our friends in school or people that we can't stand that get on our last nerve and we look at them and we say, man, when are we going to actually take responsibility to say, I guess, I guess it's my job to share the gospel with them. I'm the one that's responsible for them. I'm the one that's responsible to get to know their story. I'm the one. I, I, I wish they would change their attitude. Well, maybe I should walk into a relationship with them. I wish they would change their negativity. Man, maybe I'm the one that should be a positive light and a positive influence in their life. How long will it take us to walk past people before we begin to take responsibility for them, to share the gospel with them? John Stott has this quote. He says, we cannot, we must not be so preoccupied with learning, with sharing and worshiping that we forget about witnessing. He's like, don't be a bloated Christian. He's like, don't be, don't be so knowledge filled and, and faith filled and, and community filled that you forget to go out and share the gospel. He's like, we must not do that. And so simply, simply, I think we can ask ourselves a few questions. Simply put, like, what's the name of your neighbor? And what's their spiritual condition? What's the name of your neighbor? And what's their spiritual condition? I got Joe, Alvina, and that's it. And I got plenty of other neighbors' names that I can't remember and whose spiritual condition I do not know. So what's the name of your neighbor and what is their spiritual condition? Because here's the truth, right? Sharing the gospel, evangelizing people is not just, is not just about connecting them to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. It's also about our spiritual formation. It's also about, man, like, do I, do I trust in the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit that has filled me enough to share my story, check that, enough to share his story. Enough to say, Jesus, listen, I was broken and when I connected to your life-changing power, you made me whole and now I get the joy of sharing you with other people. And so the question then becomes like, how do we, how do we share the gospel? This is where people get, get hung up oftentimes because it's like, man, I don't know enough. I don't know the Bible enough. I, I know about three to five verses and that's about it. And I don't know if they have anything to do with salvation. And so it's like, right, you know what? I, I have a pass. And the truth is, is like, man, there are plenty of ways that we can share the gospel. There are plenty of ways that we can share Jesus with people. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about it in this manner. We start one with the bad news. I know that's so encouraging, right? We start with the bad news. We start with the bad news and not necessarily the bad news of like, you're a sinner, you're going to hell if you die. That is a terrible way to approach that conversation. Do not do that. I know some people that have done that. It has not worked in their favor. Now, to get to the bad news, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to their bad news. You need to know their story. And so ask questions. Ask them like where they grew up, how they grew up, where they're from in Florida. Nobody's from here. So, okay, all right, let's do this then. Raise your hand if you're from here. I might prove myself wrong. Oh my gosh, I am wrong. Humility comes now. There's a lot of you that are from here. But ask anyway. Ask their story, ask where they're from. Seek to understand before being understood and listen with intent. See, listening means, means that we love somebody. And it's, it's really hard for our culture in our day and age because listening isn't a hot commodity. It's not something that we all do well. 
Listening equals love. It's why Jesus sat with sinners. It's why Jesus sat with the prostitute and the tax collector. He wanted to hear their stories. And in our culture, everyone is so, is so busy looking for opportunities to share their own opinions that they forget to listen. And that's a, that's a, that's a real challenge when it comes to being able to, to hear someone's story and then ultimately like share the faith and see and exercise or, or be uh, cognizant of someone else's brokenness. And so people right now are truly like desperate to be heard. Let's be honest. There's this, uh, there's this article that came out talking about this, this former like football player, how he was getting bored during COVID. And so he was like, you know what? I, I think I got an idea. People seem to be super lonely in this season. So I am going to put an ad on Craigslist just to listen to people. Entrepreneurial idea for anybody in the room. And, uh, and so he did. And he was like, hey, the first listening session for 30 minutes is free. After that, if, if you want a listening session, it's like 30 to $60, depending on how long you want me to listen. And it's a one-sided conversation where he would just listen to people. When he started that, listening was a skill. Now listening has become an industry. Listening is literally an industry that monetizes. You can make money just sitting and listening to people. Sometimes it's deliberately a one-sided conversation because people ultimately just want to be heard. We see people, we see friends, we ourselves have quit jobs because we don't feel heard. Relationships end because we don't feel heard. People complain about not feeling heard or not being heard, but honestly, we don't really get much better at listening ourselves. Listening should be our industry as followers of Jesus Christ. We should be so passionate about, about hearing people's stories and, and, and how they have so many things going on in their worlds that it excites us when we get to venture out and hear people and seek to understand people before trying to be understood simply because we know that they have things going on in their life where Jesus and Jesus alone can insert himself into. That's the win. And so when we listen, what we're ultimately listening for is for pain points. We're not listening so that we can interject. We're not listening to say like, oh, I'm from there too. We're not listening like to be like, man, uh, you know what? I understand that. I, I have something similar. Like we're not listening to see where we can interject. We're listening to see where Jesus can interject. Everybody has pain points. Everybody has, has brokenness. And so as you, as you listen to people, pay close attention to their situations, to their circumstances, to the moments in their story that only Jesus can bring healing to. It's one of the things that I love about, about this team and about this staff, uh, because Gordon, when he, brings, when he brings us in to interview us, he asks us the weirdest question I've ever been asked during an interview process, but it has now become a part of our culture here. And he'll, he'll simply look at you and he'll say, what's your limp? AKA, where are you broken? And every, every staff member that we bring in, we ask that question. We're not asking them because we want a reason to not hire them. We need a reason to hire them and we need to know that they are humble enough to understand what Jesus has brought them out of because we want them to go out to you and ask you the same thing. We need to know that they are broken and they understand how broken they are and that Jesus has rescued them out of their brokenness. It's who we are as followers of Jesus. It's the weirdest thing I've ever been asked and I will never ever hire a staff member that we don't ask that to that can't be honest and upfront about it. Where are you broken? And are you willing to share it? Are you willing to talk about how Jesus has transformed your life because your pain is his platform for his purpose and his glory so that he can bring other people to know him? It's a beautiful thing. And so we look for those pain points in people. And right now, there are plenty going around. People are feeling lost, lonely, falling behind, lack of self-esteem, lack of purpose, empty. You talk to any of your friends, I'm sure there is something like this going on. And so we identify pain points. We ask people, where are they broken at? And then, and then you know what we do? We don't say, ah, oh, shame on you. We don't even bring like Jesus into the equation next. You know what we do? We step in the mud with them. 
We look at people in their, in their brokenness and their mess and we're like, hey, let me get muddy with you. Let me tell you about how broken I was and I need to communicate to you how broken I was because you need to understand that whatever it is you're walking through, Jesus can bring you out of it because he brought me out. And so the question becomes, are we willing to share our brokenness? I'll never forget my, my coach that stepped into my brokenness. My coach that won me to Jesus as I was living a life deep in sin. I knew God, but I did not have or really want a relationship with Jesus. And when my coach finally confronted me, after he had walked with me every single week for three years prior to that moment, when he asked me about what was going on in my life and told me I needed to get honest, he stepped in my brokenness with me. He didn't shame me. He didn't tell me I was a terrible person. He told me how the rescuer rescued him and how he was coming for me too. That's the gospel. Ed Stetcher encourages us to get muddy. He said, if we proclaim the gospel, we do it in proximity to people, stewarding their pain, their doubts, and their sin with the gentleness and love that Jesus modeled to us. And so we get their story. We listen intentionally for pain points. We get honest and transparent about getting in the mud with them. And, and then we point them to a holy and a perfect God. Then we point them to Jesus. God's holiness is his intrinsic value. It's this, it's this purity that we have no scale for, like gold and diamonds have a scale for measurement. God's holiness has no scale. God himself is the standard. It is perfection. It is the standard by which you and I conform our lives to. But we miss the mark. We couldn't meet the standard of a holy, righteous, and precious God. That's what sin is. It is God's standard, and then as we cannot reach it, but, but what man could not do to save himself, which was meet the perfect, righteous, holy standard of God, God accomplished through the cross. We couldn't do it, so he did it for us. Jesus exchanged his holy nature for our sinful nature so that we could stand before God completely clean and pure as new creations with the old gone and the new forever to be with us. We proclaim to them this good news, literally proclamation. We share it with them that the old is replaced with something new. And it's a beautiful story it's a story that says like, hey, I, I know you're in your mess in your mud and I know you have old past pains, hurts, habits, hangups, but God wants to do something new with you. And I know it's gonna be hard at first because you're gonna think that he should eradicate all of what was, but he may not, not because he cannot, but because he wants to use that as his platform. And so God may not eradicate past hurts, but he can bring present day healing. He'll do it for you. He'll heal you on the inside and then he will use your story as a vehicle to heal others in their brokenness. It's the truth of Galatians 2.20. It's what Kyle read. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life I now live, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and who gave himself up for me. It's the simple gospel in one short verse. The concept is simply this. Take for granted that we are all like iPads, right? That we all have this like outer, this outer hardware, this outer shell. And we have this, we have this software that lives inside of us that is, that is being molded and shaped by the experiences we have and the people that we are with and the pains and hurts and, and all of the things and circumstances that we go in life or through life with. And even though we still have the outer shell, what happens when we connect to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ is that Jesus in his spirit replaces the software. And he says, I'm gonna download in you everything that I am. And your past hurts and habits and hangups may still be present, but I'm coming in and I am dropping my perpetual bags and I am telling them that they no longer have a place here and they have an eviction notice and I am creating you as someone new.
Jesus wants to do something new in your life. And I love, I love iPads, right? Because like they get a, they get a new name. The outer shell may look the same, but they get a new name and the software in it is different. Well, Jesus has given you a new software and it is his spirit. You are dead to your flesh. I have been crucified with Christ. Your flesh is dead. The desires of it are dead. When you feel temptation and feel like you want to sin, don't acknowledge the lies of the flesh. It's dead. It's trying to buy time. Acknowledge it with the spirit of Christ that now lives in you. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. This life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The gospel is not complicated. The gospel is sweet. It is simple. And Jesus wants us to be intentional about sharing it with everyone that we come into contact with. A few years ago, right after COVID, while I was the student pastor, we decided that, man, we needed, we needed students to, to find a way to take ownership of not just their faith, but also of sharing their faith with their, with their friends, right? They kept bringing their friends to church, which I was super thankful for, but they wanted me to, to find their friends and share the gospel. And I'm like, why don't you share the gospel with your friends? You see them every single day. And so we decided that we would, we would do the math of figuring out, man, like if, if this many people students were in student ministries here and all of those student ministries actually had kids that were connected to Jesus. How many kids are left? How many kids that are like, if the world were to end today would die and not be with Jesus forever? And so we gave students the number, 18,000 kids that if the world were to end today, Jesus would come back today. They would not be connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And that year is one of, one of my favorite years in student ministry because we literally saw countless kids connect to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And so now the mission is ours. Now the mission is ours. Now it's, are we gonna take responsibility for the people that live next to us and across from us? Are we going to be intentional and take responsibility for the people that we walk past every single day? Or are we going to complain that somebody needs to pick that up? I think we can be intentional. And I think we can see a change in our city and on the Treasure Coast as a result. Maybe you walked in here today and, and you're like, man, he's, he's talking about sharing the gospel, but I, I've never even connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're in here and, and you need a, a new life. Maybe you're in here and you're like, man, I, I want a new nature. I want to be crucified with Christ. I no longer want to live. I want Jesus to now live in me. Maybe that's where you're at. And maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and to come into your heart and to do some transforming work. Maybe you need new software this morning. Well, it's a simple prayer, and I would love to pray that prayer with you, that you would ask Jesus to come into your life and into your heart and to change you forever, to take your past hurts, habits, and hangups, and to use them as a platform for his purpose and for his glory and to bring you present day healing. Maybe you need that. If that's you today, I would love to pray with you. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go section by section. And if you wanna pray to accept Jesus today, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand. So I'm gonna go right here in this section over here. Raise your hand right here, right here, right here, here, here. Let's pray this prayer together, family. Dear Jesus, Come on, pray it like you mean it, guys. Dear Jesus, please come. Take control of my life from this day forward. I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. I confess of my sin, and I believe that you are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. Holy Spirit of God, 
Fill me up. Gently overflow my cup. Touch my eyes and help me see me and you and you and me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person this morning that has raised their hand, that is connected to you. God, I pray that they would not leave here without telling somebody. I pray, Jesus, that your followers, God, would surround them, that they would be devoted to your word, that they would be devoted to the fellowship, which is this body, which is this family, and they would be devoted to worshiping you. God, would we all do that? God, would we all be so intentional about sharing the gospel that we would walk past our neighbors, drive our golf carts past our neighbors and feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit of God on our hearts that says, go find out their story. Jesus, may your spirit put that on our hearts until we do it. Allow us to be obedient to you, to truly worship and to honor you with our lives. Jesus, we thank you in advance for what you're gonna do in our homes. We thank you in advance for what you're gonna do in our neighborhoods. We thank you in advance for what you're gonna do in this city and on the Treasure Coast, God. We cannot wait. We cannot wait to be a part of what it is that you are about to do. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray, amen.